Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Tamarcus Straglin. I'm one of the ministers here on staff. And that is my second favorite honor next to being husband to Chrissy, my wife, and father to Taj and Matea. Um, so if you're visiting for the first time, welcome to Citizens Church. We're glad that you're here with us. Um, we're honored that you chose to, to worship with us this morning. Rather, church is a new thing for you or something that you've been doing for a while. Uh, our hope and our prayer is that you would encounter God this morning as we look to his word and as we uh, praise him in song. And this morning, we're going to be continuing to walk through the letter of James. Uh, we're going to pick up in chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. We heard a portion of that just read. And in this passage, James wants to talk to us about how we talk. Uh, as I prepared for this morning, I just took some time to think about and to consider words that have stayed with me throughout my life, for better or for worse. Um, I remember the words of Gail Miller, my old Sunday school teacher, who uh, first walked me through the gospel message, um, and I repented and believed as a child. Uh, man, those were, those were powerful words. God used those words from her in my life to draw me to himself at an early age, and I'm grateful uh, for those words. I also remember being a kid on the playground and saw a cute girl that I liked, and I told her that I liked her, and she said, ew, <laughs> you're too skinny. <laughs> and I haven't been back to that playground since. <laughs> um, but honestly, as silly as it sounds, uh, I spent years trying to disprove those words. Uh, they were small words, but I was also small at the time. And it hurt. Um, I remember being, uh, you know, a few years younger and standing in the student room at the church I formerly attended and had like 70s style like skate rink carpet. It was very, uh, very interesting room to get married in. But that's where me and my bride said I do. And in that moment, I went from being a single man to the luckiest man on the planet. Uh, powerful words. I also remember being in college. I worked at Safeway. It's like the Tom Thumb of, of their, their place. And I was a self-checkout clerk. And that means I got paid to stand in one spot and say, have a nice day for eight hours straight. And uh, one day, as I was fulfilling my monotonous task, uh, there was a couple that came through the line. And um, I was standing there. They got done. I said, have a nice day. And as they were walking by, the man stopped and he turned and looked back at me with like a scowl. He said, don't speak to me. I know you're kind. You in words don't care about anybody but yourself. And then he turned around and he walked out the store. Words are powerful. Um, the tongue is powerful. And this is precisely why James in our text this morning wants to talk to us about the way we talk. Got two points, and I'll be out of your way. The first well, is that words are powerful. The second, our words have potential. And after we tease these out, uh, I want to conclude by offering a way forward as we consider our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, first, look, at me, look with me at verses 1 through 2. James starts the chapter saying, Not many of you should become teachers. Uh-oh. Uh, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. I'm often asked if I get nervous when I preach or teach, and my response is the same every time. And to be honest, I'm afraid of the day that I'm not. Uh, how weighty of a stewardship it is for anyone to stand on a stage like this in front of a group of people like this and say, behold, this is what God says. Uh, that is a beautiful privilege, and it is also a daunting responsibility. And, then, uh, and that applies not only to, to leaders in the church from a staff perspective, but lay leaders alike. And in an age where anyone can create a kind of platform for themselves, be it on social media or through a podcast, blog, or even a stage like this on a, behind a pulpit, you can just 
bring in a whole following within days. Uh, it is in our best interest to take James's warning seriously. James begins with a warning to teachers, but he's not just talking to teachers. He's still looking for all of us who are listening and reading his words to embody that true and undefiled religion that he first spoke about when we were in chapter one, to be mature followers of Jesus. Jesus too warns his disciples uh, not to call themselves too quickly teachers and rabbis like the Pharisees who were around them who did not practice the things that they preached. James is raising a similar concern here. Because James isn't just talking about us getting it right on stage when we're in front of everybody, but he's talking about us getting it right in life. What comes out of your mouth when you're in the workplace, when you're at school, when you're in the locker room, when you're at home, when you're online? This week, I asked several friends and family uh, members, what comes to mind when you first think about a mature person? And as you would expect, I got a lot of good biblical answers. Someone who is wise, someone who is humble, someone who is a student of the word, someone who's gracious, a good listener, patient, all true godly answers. Others took the more practical route. They were like someone who fills their gas tank at night instead of waiting till the morning. And I was like, you know, I couldn't knock them. That's some mature adulting right there. Uh, And my gas light is on as we speak. Uh, (laughs) A couple people said something to the effect of being slow to speak or wise with words. They've been listening to James, you know. Um, I don't know about how you'd answer that question, but when I think about marks of maturity, there are a number of good answers, many like the ones we've listed that come to mind first before I think about how we use our words. And the thing about what James has to say is he doesn't just name it as a marker. He calls it the marker. Look at verse two again closely. He says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he or she is a perfect man, mature, able also to bridle his whole body. James says if you can control your tongue, you can control your entire body. You want to get a grip on your alcohol consumption? You want to rein in your anger? You want to tame your lust? Then let's talk about how you speak, because if you can control that, then you can control all the rest. What a claim. But James is not alone in this. Wisdom says this elsewhere in Proverbs 21, 23. One who guards his mouth and tongue guards his soul from troubles. So James gives us two images to illustrate what he's saying here. Uh, Look with me at verses three through five. He says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, We got their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Uh, I grew up in Garland, Texas, and the only time I remember seeing horses as a child was when I took a field trip to Fort Worth. And in some random fields, whenever we would go out of town, uh, we didn't live the, like, I got the horses in the back kind of lifestyle. Um, But one day, we were on vacation, and my parents signed us up to go horseback riding. And uh, all of the horses had names. I'm pretty risk averse, not really familiar with the whole horse thing, like I said. And so I'm hoping I get partnered with, like, Cupcake or (laughs) Miss Daisy or something light like that, right? I'm like, just like a little pony. I was, you know, nine or something at the time. No, I got partnered with Knucklehead. (laughs) And why anyone would put a nine-year-old on a horse called Knucklehead is beyond me. But I got on him, and y'all, Knucklehead knew within two minutes who was in control of the entire situation. (laughs) Uh, Everyone else's horses are like following the path, one behind the other, and me and Knucklehead are doing the cha-cha slide, and I'm terrified. The instructor's yelling at me. He's like, rein them in. You got to show them you're in control. And I'm like, but I'm not, and I didn't know what to do. So I prayed the most genuine prayer 
I probably have ever prayed. I'm like, Lord, if you get me off of this horse in one piece, I'll never get on a horse again. <laughs> and that has been the best kept promise I ever made to God. Um, uh, on another vacation, Chrissy and I, before we had kids, we went with my family on a cruise. And one night, me and my dad went out to the, you know, I don't know all the parts of the boat, but we were out there on the front wooden part. And you could see the water. And, you know, I'm looking out, and without all of the distractions of, like, what's on a cruise ship, I became suddenly aware that we were in the middle of nowhere. All I could see was water. There was no land. Um, the boat was much larger than I had anticipated. The waves get bigger at night. Didn't know that. And I was like, uh, I really hope we get to where we're going soon. And, you know, it's this big ship, all the wind, the waves, and it's just a little rudder at the bottom of the boat. And it took us to every stop we needed to go and got us back exactly where we needed to be. And here's the thing, right? Um, our entire person is like knucklehead, or that ship. And our tongue is the bit in the rudder, James says. So rather it's the bits in the horses or the rudders on the boat, they're small, but they're powerful, and so are our words. If we can't control the bit, we won't be able to control the beast. It will control us, and if we're not careful, it can consume us. And so who is, who is James casting this message to? Who does he have in mind? Um, I know some of us have people in mind. You're listening, you're like, Pastor, I know where you're going with this message, and I know just who needs to hear it. Um, and you're thinking about that person maybe that we all know who just lets words fly without thought and without restraint, people who just lash out. Um, Proverbs 29, 11 says it this way, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. So James is speaking to this person, but he's not just speaking to this kind of person. You see, there are those of us who use words to wound overtly. We lash out, as the passage says. And there are those of us who use words to wound covertly. And James wants to talk to all of us. Those of us who hold back words in the moment but give them full vent elsewhere are not off the hook. The Bible has words to describe this kind of thing. Gossip unconstrained conversation about another person. Anybody else guilty of that kind of use of words? Uh, at the moment, we may seem cool, but on the inside, it's a lot going on in there. And as soon as we aren't in front of the person anymore and we find a seemingly safe ear, all the things we wish we would have said in person, full vent. What about slander? The world we live in would define it as making false accusations about someone, but biblically, it's any speech, true or false, that is meant to diminish another person. You ever change people's opinion of a person with your words? You know, you're like, they're in conversation, maybe they're praising them about something that they did or accomplished, and you cut in with something to say, hoping that you could diminish everyone's view of them with your words. Or maybe you're not even using full sentences at all, but with a laugh or a grunt or a cheer, we find ourselves approving for and rooting for the very things that God would call evil. You see, like trying to get a grip on knucklehead, taming the tongue is much more nuanced and difficult than we might think at first. And that makes it all the more dangerous. Look at verses six through eight. James says, how great a fire is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. The tongue is powerful, like the bit in the mouth of horses or the small rudder on a large ship, and 
it is dangerous like fire and deadly poison. Uh, I roast coffee in my garage and fire is involved in the process. 99% of the time, the fire stays on the burners and that means I'm able to craft delicious coffee with it. And all of my coffee drinkers in the room said, Amen. Amen. But one time the fire didn't stay on the burner. Uh, It caught hold of something that it shouldn't have and immediately it began to spread. The chaff from the coffee, which was plentiful in the garage, instantly went ablaze. And within seconds, the room is full of smoke. I couldn't see, it got hard to breathe, and I started to panic. And so I'm like opening water bottles that I got sitting around trying to dump it on the fire and that's of no use. And then I'm trying to maybe if I can clean the chaff up, then that'll you know, make it better. So I get the shop vac and I'm vacuuming it up. And then smoke starts coming out of the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> And that can't be good. And before I knew it, it's just like little fires all over the place. And I remember having a moment where I was like, I'm about to burn my house down. Have you ever been in conversations like that, though? A friend uses something that you told them in trust to harm you in front of others. Someone who's supposed to be safe and loving, maybe a parent or a spouse or a friend. Uh, uses their proximity as a means to cut you deeper than any stranger could. Or have you ever dealt words like that? In a moment out of pride or insecurity or uh, hoping not to look weak or whatever the motive might have been, like Thanos with all of the Infinity Stones, you speak words and no sooner than they leave your mouth, you want them back, but it's too late. The fire spread, the damage is done. You see, the tongue is powerful, and because it is so powerful, it is also dangerous, incredibly dangerous. And James calls the tongue, in fact, a world of unrighteousness. What does that mean? He's getting at the capacity of evil and wickedness that can be uh, harbored within the tongue. I took a philosophy class uh, in school, and it, is, it was as boring as it sounds. It's a philosophy of language class. But there were a number of things that I took from the class that were, that were helpful. One of which came from a book we read by a Canadian philosopher. His name is Charles Taylor. You may know his more popular work, A Secular Age. Um, but this book was called The Language Animal, The Full Shape of the Human Linguistic Capacity. And listen to how he describes the power in language. He says, to learn the language of society is to take on some imaginary of how society works and acts of its history through time, of its relation to what is outside, nature or the cosmos or even the divine. You see, the the world as we know it, the very way we are able to engage with it and derive meaning from it, or even more the way that we're able to understand or communicate truths about God and humanity is shaped largely by the words that we use with one another. So in a sense, our words have this kind of creative power, right? And that could be used for good or for bad. So when we lie or gossip or slander or demean our neighbors, we create these whole worlds of unrighteousness, as James would say, and we bid our neighbors to live in them, to live according to a false and flawed reality that we've constructed with our words. Have you done this? I know I have, and I'm ashamed of it. Uh, I can vividly remember uh, witnessing a fight when I was in middle school, and I could still see my peer's face and his terror, really. Um, He's getting beat up, and me, along with the other onlookers, uh, I yell, ooh, get him. And I didn't throw a punch. And neither did Paul when he stood by with approval um, as believers were being stoned, but it was demonic. I don't want to create a world where people are afraid to go to school because they might get beat up and all of their peers will be cheering for their pain. Um, I remember a few months ago, uh, my son had done something he shouldn't have and I overreacted. And I can still see myself from his vantage point towering over him and he's trying to explain his actions. 
and I say, I don't care what you have to say. And no sooner than the words left my mouth, I wanted them back. Um, Son, I care so deeply what you have to say. I don't want to create a world where my son thinks his father doesn't care what he has to say. And the tongue is powerful and dangerous. It is a consuming fire, a whole world of unrighteousness. Help us, Lord. That means the biggest lie we could ever tell a child is sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Um, no, scripture says in Proverbs 15, 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Words may not break bones, but they can sure crush a spirit. Proverbs 18, 21 says life and death are in the power of the tongue. Brothers and sisters, it's no wonder James told us a little bit ago to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Because he knows if we're not careful, we can ruin our lives and the lives of those around us with our words. All of our unconstrained speech comes from somewhere. Every careless word. And James says it has hellish origins. Look what he says. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Jackie Hill Perry summed it up best. She said, if what I'm saying does not honor God, then what I'm saying has a dark source. And if the heart of hell is pride, just think of the range of foolish things that we can and have said out of pride. How many times would we have been saved from saying something foolish if we had just said instead, I don't know, or maybe just not said anything at all? No, but we've got to appear wise. We want to be seen as the keepers of knowledge, or we don't want to appear weak, or whatever our motives may be, and we speak when we ought to have been silent. And so rather than singing in unison with our creator, with our unconstrained speech, when it deviates from what is true and what is God honoring, we contend with the pure and beautiful, beautiful voice of God. It's almost as if we're saying, let there be darkness. See, the tongue is a powerful, dangerous thing. But our words also have potential. Look at verse 9. James says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who were made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come forth blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. You know, we can give the culture around us a lot of flack uh, for diminishing the authority of God, uh, the voice of God in our public sphere. But I think James would have us consider how difficult those of us who claim the name of Jesus have made it for the world to discern his voice. After all, he says, with the same tongue, we say, bless your name, God. And then we call our neighbor everything else but their name. With the same tongue, we say, we magnify your name, Lord. And then we diminish the soul of our neighbor. With the same tongue, I'm preaching to me too. We preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then we sow despair in the hearts of our loved ones. Think of how confusing that is. Think of how confusing it is to hear, I love you, and then in moments later hear, I can't stand you. You make me sick. And then again, moments later to hear, I love you. It's confusing. Verse 11 and 12, he says, does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Here James begins to drop some breadcrumbs as to how we can get to the solution in the heart of our problem. As any good sage does, he offers us a question to consider that has an obvious answer, but is rich in meaning. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? What comes out of the spring is indicative of what was already in the spring, right? 
Likewise, our words are indicative. They're like uh, check engine lights for the heart. What comes out of our mouths are indicative of what was already in our hearts. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 15, verse 18 through 20. He says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. Jesus helps us see the root of our problem. You want to be mature? Well, you need to control your tongue. But nobody can do that. James says no one can tame the tongue. He says, right, because our hearts are sick with sin. And if there's poison in our heart, there'll be poison in our words. So we've got a heart problem. But here's the, the thing about bits and rudders and fires and even our words. When they are in the hands of someone who is good, they can be used for good. Would you consider with me, friends, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? There's an old uh, Negro spiritual that we used to sing in my church growing up that reminds us of the self-control of our Lord. And a verse from it goes something like this. He never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And he never said a mumbling word for me. Here's the thing. Um, I had no idea what those words meant when I was a kid. I was like, he never, what, a mumbling word, but I, you know, just, it sounded good. You just, you go with it. Um, but I've since learned, and those, it came to mind even as I was preparing, you know, we just celebrated Easter last weekend. It was a song that we typically sung around Easter. And the line from the song was meant to draw attention to the strength of our Lord when he stood before Pontius Pilate and all of his questioning. As he was mocked and jeered by the crowds who would bid him to be crucified. As he was being beaten, uh, those who, who had the whips and the, and the chains were insulting and, and hurling threats at him. And because he never responded with poisonous words, what we know is there was only righteousness in his heart. He never said a mumbling word, not even a, a curse uttered under his breath as he died on the cross. No, instead, what we hear from the mouth of our Lord as he stands, or better yet, is hung before his accusers, is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Christ was sinless, not just in his actions, but in his words and in his thoughts and in his very heart and affections. And so when given the opportunity to curse, he blessed instead. On the cross, every careless, heartless, evil, unconstrained word that has ever been uttered and is yet to be uttered, he bore in his person. Every word we've uttered and yet to utter, our Savior paid for. Moreover, just as we witness in his crucifixion, Christ right now at the right hand of the Father speaks a better word over each and every one of us, praying for our forgiveness and our repentance and rather than our destruction. In fact, the entirety of the Godhead is in on blessing us. There's an article on Desiring God titled, How to Gossip Better. And listen to what the pastor says about the, what he calls the anti-gossip of the Trinity. He says, the imputation of Christ's righteousness is a type of anti-gossip. It is the counting of righteousness to a person who is unrighteous. When God speaks behind our back, God the Son talks to God the Father about us in such a way that he sees us as perfectly righteous, not less righteous. That Christ talks on our behalf behind our backs is actually the basis of the good news. Have you ever thought about what Jesus has to say about you behind your back? It's the anti-gossip of our risen Lord who is in the presence of the Father and the Spirit advocating for us, pleading our case by the power of his blood. And if you could only hear what your Savior has to say about you right now, 
I wonder if it wouldn't heal every word that has been spoken to you unduly or even every word that you've spoken unduly. See, it's this triune, loving, grace-filled God who has power enough to cleanse our hearts and our tongues and give us a better word to speak over one another. See, words are powerful. Words help me see God in Miss Gail's class on Sunday. Words married me in the church, hurt me in the playground, hurt me at the grocery store, and I've used words to hurt friends and families and strangers. And words have me up here right now, trying to be faithful to God's word with a people whom I love, and if I'm honest with y'all, there's a voice of shame in the back of my mind saying, you shouldn't be up there saying those things. But I'm reminded then of the prophet Isaiah, who after seeing a vision uh, of God, said, woe is me, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm of a people of unclean lips. You see, Isaiah was honest with God about his words. And you know what God did next? He cleansed them. You have a relationship with words. How they've hurt you, how they've blessed you, how you've hurt others and how you've blessed others. And as we close, maybe we can take one out of Isaiah's book and just start by being honest with God about our words. You know, in a world that is marred with sin, uh, what it looks like for righteousness to always be on our tongue might sound something like, son, daddy, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, Would you forgive me for how I spoke out of turn? That was inappropriate. Um, Maybe instead of the, I'm sorry if my words made you feel that way, maybe a more genuine, um, I shouldn't have said that, and I'm, I'm sorry that the motives of my heart were impure when I said it. Would you forgive me? See, honesty with God about our words is the beginning to him cleansing our hearts and our words. So if you would, would you pray this prayer with me as we close? Father, we, we confess to you that our tongues are far more powerful and dangerous than we give it credit for. And we need your wisdom. We need your heart to steward it well. Would you help us, God? For every word that has wounded us, would you heal us, Father? Would you remind us that the words of hell are of no substance at all in comparison to the beautiful, eternal words of dignity and love that you speak over us? For every word that we have wounded others with, would you heal them and forgive us? Would you remind us that on the cross, Christ bore the debt of all our unconstrained speech so that we wouldn't have to. Thank you, God. And lastly, Lord, would you remind us of the good work you've given us to do with our words, that you've given us good news to share. Your word says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Words are indeed powerful, and we have words that set captives free, that gives rest to the weary, that comforts the afflicted, that turns hearts from wickedness and snatches souls out of darkness and brings them into your marvelous light. Lord, when we open our mouths to speak, would these things be on our lips? May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.